Okay, last week we talked about this concept that is um, definitely within the character of God and is found often through in scriptures. And it is this concept of the way that God frames opposing views in, right next to each other in order to emphasize one of them over the other. Um, and it's, I mean, the word that we would use to sum this up is just contrast. But an example of this would be the way that God frames um, our pain right next to healing. Um, a good example would be like from last week in Matthew 26, verses 1 through 29, those scripture we read last week, the idea of God framing the betrayal of his disciple, Judas, right there with the faithfulness of Jesus. So God has this way of, of taking sin and darkness and sorrow and tribulation, and almost like if you just imagine your life like a wall, he frames that right next to his grace and his mercy and his beauty and the glory of his kingdom. And the reason why he does that is because we have a way as humans of convincing ourselves that that darkness and that sin or that, that, that evil, that tribulation, whatever the pain is, it's not actually that bad. And you can frame your wall out with this stuff. And you're like, man, that's my story. And, it, and it's not as bad as like this person's story. And so we have a way of rationalizing our poor decisions and our sin. But that can't happen the moment that he hangs his glory and his kingdom right next to it. Because once you have the comparison of what Jesus lived, the stuff you're trying to convince yourself is okay is just simply not okay anymore. We talked about Isaiah prophesying to a culture that said, look, what we love doing most of all is is calling good evil and evil good. And that's the heart of what God is trying to do when he, in in his mercy, he does this because he loves us. He doesn't just erase the tough things in our life. He frames them in a way right next to his mercy so that we see how infinitely greater he is and how much he loves us in the midst of how garbage we can be on a daily basis. Amen? So, That was the theme that we went through from Matthew 26, verses 1 through 29. We're still in the book of Matthew, um, chapter 26. So what I want to do is I want to continue with this theme today. I want us to look and read through the rest of chapter 26, and I want us to identify these different contrasts that Matthew brings out. Now, this story um, from like verse 30 all the way through 75, I think that's where we finished today, It's a timeline of Jesus' last hours before he's arrested. Now you could read this just simply as a timeline alone, and you could get some interesting information out of it. But I'm encouraging us to read it with the mindset of what we started last week of identifying the contrast within this, because what Jesus is doing, and what Matthew is, is helping us see, is that this concept of comparing, the, or con- comparing and contrasting that floods all the way through Matthew chapter 26 helps us understand some things about ourself. So if we just read this as a timeline, then we're gonna walk away like some history students who learned some things that actually did happen in history. But if we read this with the mindset that there are some contrasting themes within this timeline, for example, the contrast between Peter and Judas, or the contrast between the trial of Jesus and the trial of Peter towards the end of this chapter, What we do is we set ourselves up to be able to not just hear the word of God today differently, but also start reading the Bible on a regular basis differently. Because my goal for us is that it's not for us to just be able to know or to gain information when we read the Bible. My goal for us as the pastor here is that we start learning principles that we use to to read the word of God in a way that when we're reading it, we start growing. All right, so... Just make this clear. You can read this just as a, as a historical text that this happened. Jesus went here, and then he had this conversation with the disciples, and then he was arrested, and then this happened over here with Caiaphas's house. Or you can say, okay, these are the things that are happening. Let's just say you're reading this on your own personal Bible study. These are the things that are happening but what can I learn from the things that are happening? I don't wanna just hear the stuff that's happening. I wanna hear it. I wanna learn from it. There are principles baked into this because of the way the Holy Spirit works through God's word that I can learn from these specific timelines. And that's what I wanna do today. So I'm just giving you a heads up, just a warning. It's gonna be kinda like drinking from a fire hose today. Because we're gonna cover a lot of scripture And there are lots of different principles that we're gonna pick out as we go through here. 
And my point is not for you to walk away with like one, wow, that was a really profound thing. What I want to do is I just, I, I just want to spray the entire, entirety of what we're studying here today with this one concept that God contrasts good stuff and bad stuff, and all the many ways that he does it so that when you leave here, you can't help but read the word of God differently moving forward. That's my goal for today. Cool? I want you to be able to, when you read the word of God, I want you to start digging in and saying, okay, this is a thing that happened, but it's not enough for me to just know that this is a thing that happened. I want to know how this thing impacts and challenges me because I want to grow. Amen? Okay, with that in mind, let's go ahead and start. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start in verse 30. <clears throat> it said, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Okay, Peter. um, Jesus says to Peter, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter looks Jesus square in the eye and says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then all of the disciples said the same thing. Now this conversation happens right after the Passover meal. Jesus is sitting around the table with his disciples and he has shared the Passover meal with them and he shares communion with them and then he tells them, one of you is going to betray me. And they're all looking at each other like, who's it gonna be? And then Judas leaves the table and he goes and he sells out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and he agrees to hand over Jesus to tell the soldiers where he will be at a specific time and he gets paid for it. But beyond that, right after this conversation, Jesus is walking up to the Mount of Olives. So if you picture the city of Jerusalem, it's kind of like on a hill. When you exit the gate, there's this valley that you go down into. And when you get to the bottom of the valley, you start going back up. As you're going up, you're going up to the Mount of Olives. So on this mountain, right next to the mountain that Jerusalem sits on is the Mount of Olives. And it's covered in olive trees. It's beautiful. And there's a position on the Mount of Olives when you go up there and when you sit, you can look over Jerusalem and you could have seen the temple. So it's nighttime, it's late, it's probably like 10 or 11 at night. Jesus and his disciples, they finished a meal, they're going down, they're walking up. And the first thing that Jesus does as he leaves this is he starts singing. And they all start singing. So this is the first contrast I want to bring out as we're studying studying just a simple timeline of what's happening. The darkest night of Jesus' life is contrasted right here with what? Singing and worship. Jesus is about to tell them in verse 31, all of you guys are gonna fall away. And he knows that they're gonna fall away. So he's walking with a bunch of guys that he knows in in like four hours, all of them are gonna turn their back on him. And what is he doing with that information? He's singing and he's worshiping. So what does this say to us? The fact that Jesus knows how dark it's about to get, and his response is to worship. Well, this contrast teaches us about the posture we should have through tribulation. See, he knew what was coming, and he chose to worship. We don't know what's coming when we leave this building, but you should still choose to worship. There is an attitude that you can choose to have when things don't go your way. You can choose to complain, you can choose to get bitter, or you can choose to sing about it. Now that seems completely contrary to the way that we would handle problems, right? But I got news for you. We don't handle problems like the world handles problems. We are a very peculiar people. 
We believe that our God beat death. He died and then rose from the dead. And we also believe that one day he's gonna come back for us in the clouds and split the sky and resurrect us. Guys, that's weird stuff. So when I say that our posture, when we face tribulation, is to sing about it, you just go ahead and throw that into the pile of all the other weird stuff that we do as the people of God. But the thing is, is that it's only weird if you're looking at it through the lens of the world. If you're looking at it through God's lens and the way that God structures his kingdom, that's what's right and normal, and the world is wrong and broken. The world would say, what is the point of singing and worshiping and lifting up a God who would let bad things happen to good people? And we would say, there are no good people. There are only bad people that he has redeemed. And because of that, buddy, it makes me want to sing. I want to worship. When I came up here and uh, said, uh, well, uh, came talked to Chrissy right after worship. I told her, I was like, I don't even want to preach. I want to, get, I want to go out and sing some more. Because there is something that, that happens in the heart of a person when you realize that the only thing that you can do to solve a problem is sing about it. Some of you have never hit those kind of problems before. Because most things in your life, you can come up with a solution if you just give enough time and enough money. But there are some things in life you can't solve. And you're going to have to fix your eyes on the king and say, you know what? Your will be done. And however you want this to pan out, I surrender to you. And really, the only thing I could do right now is sing about it. And this is what's happening to Jesus, and this is what should be happening to us. What we're seeing is an overflow of gratitude that the Son is giving to the Father at this moment. Now, I'll just give you this as kind of unrelated, but a little nugget that I think will help some of you in here. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul says this. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let me read that one more time. Give thanks in all circumstances, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So all of those folks running around saying, I don't know what God's will for my life is. The Bible tells you what God's will for your life is. To, be, to give thanks in all circumstances. Well, that's not helpful. I want my circumstances to change. That's not what being a Christian is about. It's not about coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, change the people around me. Change my life. Give me different circumstances. Give me a different life. Give me a different job. God's will for your life is to learn how to be thankful and grateful in the circumstances you are in right now. That's God's will for your life. Not my words, the Bible's words. And so what we're witnessing here as Jesus is singing in the midst of one of the darkest nights of his life is an overflow of gratitude and a giving thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Here's another contrast. The contrast of the faithfulness of Jesus being contrasted with the faithfulness of the disciples. In verse 31, it says, you guys are all going to fall away. And in verse 32, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to go before you to Galilee. Even though you all fell away, I'm going to come back and I'm going to gather you. This contrast reminds me of God's faithfulness because God is infinitely more faithful than we are. That is a contrast that when we hang on the wall, when we see, when I frame out my faithfulness to God over the years versus his faithfulness to me, I'm embarrassed and that's how it should be. Because the moment I start thinking, man, I'm hot stuff because of all the things I do for Jesus, then all of a sudden I've got my eyes fixed on me and I'm building my kingdom and I'm not building his kingdom. So God in his mercy, he frames up my failures right next to his faithfulness, just like he did here, to remind us of his grace. Now, this is not an excuse for us to be a child for the rest of our lives. Well, if Jesus always covers our mistakes, then it doesn't really matter what I do. That's not the point of this. The point of this is not to just make an excuse that, man, I can always, I can just, it doesn't matter what I do because he's going to save me out of it. The point of this is that when you do fail, your mistakes are covered, but there is still a demand on you to obey and love Jesus. 
Now this last one, this interesting contrast of Peter flexing his faithfulness against the disciples' faithfulness and also the contrast of his words versus Jesus' words is probably my favorite one. In verse 33, he says, look, Jesus, though every single one of them, though they all fall away, I will never fall away. Everybody else is going to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Now, this is interesting because Peter's got quite a long list of failures going on at this moment, even in the midst of him flexing on everybody else, talking about how many lack of failures he has. He, does, he has a long history of correcting Jesus, right? Back in Matthew 16, 22, he tells Jesus, you're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That's a pretty big failure. I don't know that Jesus has ever called me Satan. <laughs> so he gets to this place where he says, Jesus, what you're saying is wrong. You're not going to be murdered. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So he's competing, he's setting his words up against Jesus's, but he's also framing himself as better than everybody else in the group. And this contrast reminds us of the dangers of having the wrong view of ourselves. Why is it so important for us to be in community? So that you will stop having the wrong view of yourself. So that you will stop looking in the mirror saying everything is right when everything is wrong. See, because the thing about Peter here is that he was not actually, he didn't, he stopped having an issue with Jesus going to the cross. They already argued about that back in Matthew 16. He said, this is not going to happen. And Jesus says, it is going to happen. Stop getting in my way. And, and Peter's like, okay, then cool. Then I accept the cross. So if he accepted the fact that Jesus was going to die, what is he saying here? He's saying, I accept the fact that you are going to die, but I don't think I need it. I accept that you're going to offer forgiveness, but the forgiveness you're going to offer is for everybody else because I don't need it because I'm never going to turn my back on you. I'm better than the rest. You see his argument here? I have no need of what you're offering because I'm already the most faithful in the group. But by the end of the night, we know what's going to happen. That Peter's going to need forgiveness too, and we need forgiveness. And I mentioned this last week, the power of forgiveness in our culture today. It is the basis of our entire relationship with God. Forgiveness is what everything, forgiveness is the currency that we Christians deal in. It's the foundation for everything that we do. We don't have a relationship with God without forgiveness. But one of the things that we love doing most is withholding forgiveness from one another. It's the thing that made all of this possible, but it's the one thing we don't like extending and sharing. And the reason why is because much like Peter, we have a wrong view of ourselves. We're convinced so often that we are the exception to the rule. Forgiveness, that's for somebody else. You don't know what they did to me. Well, we're about to read the story of a God who took on human flesh and made no mistakes, was, was, was completely flawless, no sin, and was murdered because of trumped up wrong accusations. And while he's hanging on the cross, he says, forgive them, for they do not, they do not know what they're doing. So if our God models forgiveness for us, who are you to say that you are the exception to some rule because somebody doesn't know the circumstances that revolve around your particular issue? If you're going to follow Jesus and put your feet in his steps, those steps are at the pace of forgiveness. And you're going to have to learn to be okay with it. And I'm not saying it's easy. But I started this saying we need to be challenged because we have to grow. And one of the greatest areas that as Christians we have to grow in is in the area of forgiveness. Because the world has been telling us that forgiveness is a lie and that a better choice is to remove that toxic person from your life. That's how you deal with issues. You remove them. You make them disappear. That is anti-gospel. That is the opposite of what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible is teaching us to walk in forgiveness. Now, I did an entire message series on forgiveness last year. I'm not saying that you have to keep people around you 
that pull you down in a way that keep you from walking in step with the gospel. What I am saying is that walking in forgiveness means letting somebody off the hook, not necessarily always letting them sit at your dinner table. Are you following with me? There is a difference between I'm going to let anything you do just pass because I forgive you and letting someone who has done something wrong against you off the hook or vice versa, knowing that you have done something to somebody else and ignoring the fact that you are required by the words of Jesus to go to them and make it right. Forgiveness is important. And it's one of the things we see contrast in these first verses. Let's go to uh, verse 36. So at this, this point, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Please remain here and watch with me. And going on just a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. Man, picture this. Our king, Jesus, king of the universe, takes on human flesh. And what does he do? He falls to his knees and he buries his face in the dirt because he knows what's coming. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What is he talking about? What cup? He's talking about the cup of suffering that he's about to face at the hands of Rome and the Jewish leaders. He's talking about the suffering that will be experienced by being hung on a cross to die. This is the cup. Verse 40, and he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Mm. That's tough words right on the heel of, I'll never betray you. Peter, wake up. Huh? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh, it is weak. So again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. And my, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same things again, asking the Father to take this cup away. I don't want to suffer, but what I want more than not wanting to suffer is your will being done. So here's what I want, but I want what you want more. Verse 45, and he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. The hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. So rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. All right, let's back up to 36 and look at the first contrast that Matthew gives us here. Did you catch who he brought with him into, uh, so all of the disciples came with him to Gethsemane, but he brought three very specific guys with him uh, deeper into the garden to pray. He took Peter and James and John. Those were the same three guys who were on the Mount of Transfiguration. So what we see here, Matthew is giving us this contrast of Peter, James, and John contrasting the Transfiguration with Gethsemane. Now Gethsemane was a place on the Mount of Olives and it meant, Gethsemane was a Hebrew word that meant wine press. And so what we're seeing here is Jesus inviting these three men to not just share in the moment of his glorification on the Mount of Transfiguration, but also to share in the suffering of the Son of God burying his face in the dirt, pleading with the Father, take this cup of suffering from me, but if it's not your will, I'll do it. So the invitation is, join me in the glory, but join me in the suffering. And what was their response? They slept. And this contrast reminds us that as disciples today, we are also invited to share in this same thing with Jesus. Romans 8, 17 reminds us that we, can, we are invited to share in his suffering, but also share in his glory. 
But for the Christian, there is both. You don't get to just share in the joy of the king without walking this life of pain so that the sin that is rooted so deep on the inside of you is put to death and a new man is resurrected. The other one that's fascinating to me is the contrast of the disciples' prayer life with Jesus' prayer life. These three people were invited in to share in a time of sorrow and prayer with Jesus, and what they chose to do instead was sleep. I don't know that I could think of a better picture of the church over the last year than this moment right now. Over the last year, Christians in mass numbers have just been decided, man, because of this whole pandemic thing, I'm just gonna sleep. I'm not gonna pray. I'm not gonna study. I'm not gonna meet with other believers. I'm not gonna do what the Bible commands me to do, to share in communion and in fellowship with other people. I'm gonna stay home and I'm gonna sleep. Now look, I realize this touches on some some touchy subjects because it's almost impossible to talk about this stuff without the world interjecting a political side to this. But I'm not coming at this from a political side. I don't have an agenda other than the kingdom of God. And the truth is that by and large, a large, huge, mass number of churches just decided over the last year to go to sleep. And while we were asleep, the enemy took advantage of us and started furthering other worldviews and other agendas. And some of us are like, the alarm is going off. And like, what is happening in the world? What is happening in the world is what happens in the world when the saints go to sleep. It is time for us to wake up. Up. It is time for us to again start taking our relationship with Jesus seriously. It is time to embrace the invitation that he gives us to pray with one another, to stay watchful of the world, to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done, and to get to work in discipling people. Guess what you can't do if you're staying at home? Discipling people. You cannot afford to check out on your responsibility as a disciple in God's kingdom. We are ambassadors, and if we don't do it, it will not get done. There is a mandate on us. There is a responsibility on us to be ambassadors, to go out and to disciple, to to preach the word of God. And if we're not doing it because we're too busy being asleep, then there will be a judgment coming our way. That's what we were told last chapter, that everybody will be given, will stand before the Lord and have to give an account for what they did with their lives. So, in addition to this contrast teaching us a lot about where we are right now as a church, this contrast also teaches us a lot about prayer. It teaches us first that one of the greatest enemies to prayer is our daily life. Because let's just make a solid argument here. These guys, these disciples, they just had a big meal and drank alcohol. They drank wine. They weren't taking communion with grape juice, all right? They were taking communion with the real, real stuff. And they just sat around the table and had a big Passover meal and it's late, so their bellies are full, it's late, they're tired, and they're in the garden. Look, all of these are symptoms of just simple daily life. It was hard for them to stay awake because they were tired. And so this teaches us that one of the enemies of prayer is just our normal daily life. It's the normal rhythm you go in. One of the enemies of prayer is your sleepiness. One of the enemies of prayer is your appetite. You would rather eat than pray. That's why fasting is so important. 
Because your flesh wants and wants and wants, and your calendar is a reflection of how much your flesh wants, and your bank account is a reflection of what your flesh wants. And if you're not telling your flesh no, then the just regular rhythm of daily life starts building up to a point where you legitimately don't have time for him, and that's exactly what the enemy loves. He loves that you don't have time for him. Well, how do you fix that? You're gonna have to start saying no to some good things in order to say yes to even greater things. That is what being a disciple is all about. It's the trade of saying no to this so I can say yes to this. This contrast also teaches us about the joys of shared prayer. Jesus wanted to share this moment, but they went to sleep. It teaches us about the importance of repeating our prayers, but also resting in God's answer. Jesus prayed the same thing three times, and the Father's answer was no. So this also teaches us that we can live obedient lives, pray with faith, faith, and still not get the answers that we're asking for. And that is okay. So when we're praying for something, we pray with the fervency that, God, this is what I want. But I'm also aware that sometimes my desires don't line up with your desires. So if this is not what you want, I want your will to be done more than what I want. But I'm praying that my will is in line with yours. So Lord, heal this person. But the same faith I use to say, heal this person, I also believe I use that same faith to trust that you're gonna do what you want to do in this situation, and I'm okay with that. Let's move on to verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas came. He was one of the 12. And with a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. And they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. You know who that was? Peter. (laughs) Mister, I'll never turn my back on you. See, and I prove it. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? And at that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. That word robber is used uh, in the first century as a a replacement for zealot. So he's essentially saying, why are you treating me um, like a a, a zealot Jewish person who's trying to overthrow Rome when all I did was, was sit regularly in the temple and teach? How come you didn't come then? Verse 56, I'll tell you why. Because all this has taken place at the scriptures and the prophets might be fulfilled. And then at that moment, all of the disciples left and fled. So look at some contrasts here. First, you got Judas, the self-serving, being contrasted with Jesus, the servant of all. Jesus is over here in the garden praying, my will is to have this cup taken from me, but I want your will to be done. And then Judas is over here saying, what are you going to give me for my betrayal? I want my will to be done. And this contrast reminds me of what is expected in God's kingdom. We don't receive forgiveness to continue serving ourselves. We don't get put in a position where we have received forgiveness to then go and build our own little kingdoms now that we are forgiven people. Our goal is to let his will be done not to do your thing and not to be, take the finances of heaven to build your thing. This is a huge issue within the church, that we take the anointing of God to build our own personal kingdoms. People in leadership use the structure of God's kingdom to hold power and not serve one another. And you see this in news headings all across, denominations, You see this in in news headlines, and look, it's just the beginning. 
Because God is doing a work in cleansing his house because he has had enough of people whose heart want nothing to do with him because they're too busy controlling people. God is not interested in disciples who love controlling others and not surrendering to him. And so he's gonna clean house. This other contrast of Peter being contrasted with Jesus and how God works his plan out. It's funny to me, Peter is a man of action and so he demonstrates his faithfulness with a sword. I'll prove to you how faithful I am by cutting off this guy's ear. I can imagine Jesus is like, I mean, I don't get it, but okay. I don't understand how that is a proof of your, but he's like, okay, you did it. And he's like, no, like there's a better way, Peter. Like I'm also a man of action, but I'm demonstrating that in my faithfulness to submission. And you see this a lot. People are proving how much they love God by all the things they can do rather than just obeying the simple things that God told us to do. We see that in our own lives, right? You start making this list of all the things you've done for him and why that makes you credible. But then if you you made a list of the things that you're obeying that he told us to do, that you're not checking many of those boxes. And that's where Peter lives. And this contrast reminds us that God is always in control. He has the ability to call down angels and do anything he wants, but he most often lets lets things simply work together for our good and his glory. I got bad news for you. You spend a majority of your time thinking you've got to defend Jesus when he doesn't need defending. He's the king of the universe. I promise he's got this. There are simple things that he has asked you to do that you are ignoring right now because you feel like you are some warrior that needs to stand up for Jesus so that these principles, well, okay, yes, these principles are true and and these are things we're supposed to be obeying, but how about these things that you're not obeying over here? How about the fact that we love posturing ourselves online so that people can see the way that we know the scriptures or the way that we have a perspective or a thought on something, but, but privately we're not obeying most of what we post. I saw somebody post something this week. He said, we need to be able to give our children the joy of what it feels like to not have an opinion on something. That's what you should teach your children. That there is a joy in not having an opinion on something. That there are things that the Lord has told us to do and if we spend our time focusing on that, there is very little time to spend all of your time sharing your opinion about things you don't know anything about. You know what you should know about? His kingdom, being a disciple of him, being transformed by him, treasuring him above all other things. The world is telling you that you need to think certain things about specific issues when you have already been told by your king how to think about those issues. But the pressure from the world is heavy and you feel like you've got to compromise or find a way that both of them can hold hands. And I'm telling you, they're never going to hold hands. The world and our Lord and his kingdom will never hold hands. They are completely contrary because the enemy, Satan, is the prince of the power of the air and he is behind furthering these agendas and these worldviews that are contrary to the way that God told us his kingdom is set up. Let's go to verse 57. This is then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. Why do you think they couldn't find anything? Though many false witnesses came forward, at least two came forward, and one of them said, this man over here, he said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Well, that's not actually what he said. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. 
And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Ooh, Jesus. Well, that's a really good response. Verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes. Ah, he's uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. And then they spit in his face and they struck him and some slapped him. And they said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came up and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them saying, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you mean. And when they went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. She said to the bystanders, this, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. And, and again, he denied it with an oath saying, oh no, I, I, don't, I don't know the man. I don't even know who he is. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. You sound like you're from Galilee. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the sayings of Jesus before the rooster crows. You will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Here's an interesting contrast. The trial of Jesus and the trial of Peter. Jesus is being led before the high priests and his actions and his words are being weighed inside Caiaphas's house. And just outside Caiaphas's house, in sight line of Jesus, Peter, his words and his actions are being weighed. Did you not say that you would never turn your back on him? The one who swore allegiance to the end is now swearing I never knew him. What does this contrast teach us? It teaches us the importance of pressure. Because all of us have the ability to lie to ourselves about where we are in our spiritual maturity. We all make these bold claims and say some pretty amazing things about ourselves. We're all really good about making sure that we convince people that we're worth their time. The problem is that most of that stuff we believe about our stuff, ourself is a lie. But we don't realize it's a lie until the moment that the pressure is turned up. And that's the beauty of tribulation. That's the beauty of trials. That's why God is having you walk through whatever season you're in right now. That's why whatever you're experiencing is so painful. It's not because God has abandoned you. It's because it is his way of turning up the pressure to expose what is truly in here so it can be dealt with and, ch and changed. The truth is, is that there is a spiritual cancer spreading on the inside of your soul and you think you're okay, but God loves you too much for you to continue walking around dying on the inside. He's not okay with a bunch of whitewashed tombs and religious church people who, have, who are full of dead men's bones, who are dry and, and, and dead on the inside. That's not okay with the kingdom of God. That is not the bride that is, he is preparing for his son, Jesus. The bride of Christ is not gonna be a whitewashed tomb filled with dead men's bones. It is gonna be a, a filled with people who have completely surrendered themselves to Jesus and treasured him above all other things that have sold everything they have to go buy that treasure in the field because what they found in that field is infinitely more valuable than anything they've ever had or built up or saved up or stored up in their life so far. And I see so many Christians not understanding the simple principle of learning how to treasure Jesus above your own life. 
This is one of the greatest struggles of our time. It's not the world out there. It's not all the competing worldviews. It is the idea that we have convinced ourselves that we can treasure our own lives and our own treasure and also hold hands with Jesus. And you can't do both. Old people, teenagers, everybody in between, hear me. You cannot continue to love your life and also love Jesus. You have to forsake this world and forsake your desires and forsake your personality and forsake your anger and forsake your unforgiveness and fix your eyes on Jesus and begin to treasure him above all of that baggage you've been carrying around and has given you an identity for 40 years. It is not worth it and it is not why Jesus died and rose from the grave. What is being offered is not a better version of your current life. It is a completely dead version of your life and a new brilliant resurrection. That's what's being offered. So, what's beautiful about this is that what Jesus is doing inside of Peter and what God is working through this moment is that he's preparing Peter at this moment for something he's gonna need for ministry in the future. This moment of complete letdown that will be redeemed later on in the book of John where Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, you know that I love you. And what does Jesus say? Then go feed my sheep. If you truly love me, then go and tell others about the forgiveness that I have shown you. Go and show others about the love that I showed you when you and I both know you sat there when I needed you most and turned your back on me. But Peter, I still love you. And that's why I came back to Galilee to see you. Do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you. And feed my lambs. For every moment that Peter denied Jesus, Jesus made Peter say, I love you. Three denials, three confessions of I love you. Because what Peter would need from this moment is an accurate view of himself because he would be a cornerstone in the planting of this new thing called the church. And this is what I want us to think about when we look at these experiences as we read through Matthew chapter 26. God is not just doing this in the life of Peter and this is not a standalone moment that we just read and say, oh, well, I mean, it's good, good that's in there. We need to read this and realize that God is doing something very similar in our lives. He is sending people our way. He's using moments of brokenness. He's exposing our heart for the purpose of transforming us to serve others. Why? Because whatever you're learning right now in this moment, you're gonna need for the rest of your life. I tell this to the pastoral candidates all the time. There's four guys here that I'm pouring myself into and raising them up so that they can be ready to step into a role of pastoral ministry. And one of the things I tell them on a regular basis is, look, dudes, I don't know what is coming your way in the next year or five years or 15 years, but whatever you're going through right now is preparing you for that. Whatever you're learning right now, you're, you're, you're developing tools that you will need 15 years from now because this conversation we're having over the phone about this struggle or this thing that you're, you're getting over, you're gonna be having a conversation with somebody else on the phone, shepherding them through it. So you don't get to pull the ejection cord and say, it's too much for me because what that does is it positions you to not be used by God 10 years from now in that moment when somebody's gonna pull something on you and the Lord's gonna work through you and that is not reserved just for these pastoral candidates because they're gonna be in ministry. This is for everyone that calls himself a disciple of Jesus. He enjoys, infinitely enjoys, using his people to heal his people. And I don't know why you're going through what you're going through right now, but I'm telling you based off of scripture and the way that God frames things, what you're going through is, is to transform your heart, but also to be well equipped to be able to serve somebody else that you have not even met yet, probably. And I'm telling you, if you start thinking about your life like that, if you start framing out your daily experiences like that, then all of a sudden the stuff you're going through, man, doesn't feel like anything. 
I can get through this because I know you're with me. And I know, even though I can't see it, that what I'm learning, it's tools for what I'll need in the future. So, what I want us to do as we close out Matthew 26, as we finish today, is I want us to be thankful because of the beautiful way that Jesus frames out things that are not great next to things that are beautiful. Because of the way that he uses circumstances that we would say from a distance, mm, need to avoid that. The way he says, no, I want you to walk through it. Because you're gonna learn something at that moment that you're not gonna be able to learn any other way and you'll need it for what's coming in the next seven years. And if you can believe that by faith, then all of us will be more well-equipped to face any season he's coming our way. Because we either believe that he works together all things for our good and he has a plan for what we're going through, or we think that he's asleep at the wheel and he doesn't know what he's doing. Amen? Let's pray.